Buddhist perspective with you so that you not, do not become that workaholic. That doesn't mean you don't work hard, okay? You do want to work hard, but you have to keep things in, in perspective. There are a ton of opportunities here at Houghton, both the formal opportunities, whether it's extracurricular activities, whether it's sports activities, whatever they may be, that will, will, will benefit you. And then also the informal. And you know, frankly, when we were here, Connie and my, uh, my blood bride were here, we actually learned to have fun that when we went out from here, because it was such a closed community and you know, there wasn't a lot to do uh, locally, in a sense, to go away from here, we actually learned to have a lot of fun with our friends. And that actually carried forward after we left here. So take advantage of that. Spiritually, this is going to be, again, one of those rare times from uh, your, your lifetime that you're going to either be exposed to the truth for the first time. When I came to Houghton, I was not redeemed. And in fact, I can still remember they called me down. I uh, made my application here, early admission. This is the place I wanted to be. This is the only place I wanted to be. The only reason I picked Houghton, it was I uh, had a more conservative perspective. This was the time of the Vietnam Wars. They were having riots in the colleges up in Buffalo. I knew I wanted to go to law school at that time. They were interrupting the classes for the kids trying to get into law school. I was in love that. I wanted to go to conservative school. I wasn't Catholic. Uh, and I could have gone to a Catholic conservative school, so this was the only one that came up when I did the search. They brought me down here and they said, you know, I was looking at your background. You know, we understand you're coming from a fairly liberal mainline church. United Church of Christ was my background. Uh, very liberal, in fact, um, my perspective apostate at this point. They said, you know, we got this community standard stuff down here. Uh, no smoking, no drinking, no card playing, no movies. Uh, I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, I didn't go to, you know, I could give up the movies during that time frame. And I played double soccer with my mother. She wasn't coming to school with me, so not a problem. Didn't understand the whole concept of Christian liberal arts education. Came down here, actually came to the Buffalo campus and went there first. Um, and at that point, a lot of people, well, I started to realize very quickly that there's a difference here in the students. And the, it took the students about a month to realize that I was not a believer. And then after that, I was a marked person on campus. So, uh, and actually, it was interesting. I talk about this broad spectrum of the evangelical community. Uh, the, two, the two groups that really worked with me, I had a fellow that was a what I call a classic all-American Baptist, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes, the classical uh, type, and two charismatic guys, friends of mine. The two, two groups were working, and they're the ones that essentially brought me to the Lord here at Houghton. And as a, as a result, you know, I have a, a great uh, respect for them and also for what the college has done and can do for you. So again, you'll, you'll, this is one of those times you can be proud of the truth or deep in your walk because you are going to be exposed to this company, a broad spectrum of the evangelical community across the, across the, the spectrum of the, of the church. While you're here, again, learn this concept of what true faith is. Life is not easy when you leave here. You will confront a lot of different issues as you go here, uh, both good things and uh, bad things. Uh, but learn this concept of true faith. And true faith, again, is that absolute trust in God regardless of what the circumstances show you. That it doesn't make any sense to do that trust. All you need to do is walk down the folks in the Hall of Faith in uh, uh, Hebrews 11. Uh, Noah, build a boat. Why do I have to build a boat? It's going to rain. Had it ever rained before? No. He may not rain was. Okay? Did he build the boat? He built the boat. Uh, Abraham, which we'll talk about a little bit later, sacrificed your son. Yeah, but your word says that's murder. Yeah, I know, but sacrificed your son anyway. So what did he do? He went to do that, and of course the Lord intervened. So you want to have that concept because it's, it's going to serve you well as you walk through this world. Uh, and again, your walk is not by sight, but by faith. Biblical concept of rest. You know, I always have this discussion with some of my friends, particularly in the Presbyterian Church, and although we go to Presbyterian Church, we're not really Presbyterians. I always ask the question, what day is the Sabbath? I ask you, what day is the Sabbath? It is not a trick question. What day is the Sabbath? Okay, that's the usual answer. The correct Old Testament answer is what day? Saturday. Okay, but what is the real Sabbath? It's every day. Every day. How often are you supposed to rest in God and rest in the Lord? Every day. How often are you supposed to worship Him? Every day. How often are you supposed to pray? Always. It's every day. It's a different standard and set that you have to get in your mind here. And again, uh, gra grasp hold of that. True humility is another one. You know, if you walk out of here with the concept that you have rights, you're, from a Christian perspective, in the wrong boat. You really don't have any rights. And I'm speaking as a lawyer. 
who defends people's rights. Okay, but from a true humility perspective, you know, you basically want to put yourself last, and if you go through life with that perspective, you'll be much happier. Um, develop a servant's heart. True humility is essential to do that, to develop that servant's heart. Learn to love the word, both written and living. Uh, study the word and think critically about it. I remember, I remember one time as I was uh, working through this, and, and frankly, being a lawyer gives you an advantage because you know, lawyers are taught to do research and think critically about what they're reading and, and put together principles of, of action. But I ran across these passages, and this is one of those fundamental passages that made me start thinking critically. There's an, a character in the Old Testament called the Angel of the Lord. And you look at the angel of the Lord, and he shows up in various locations. And people worship the angel of the Lord. They offer sacrifices to the angel of the Lord. It's like the angel of the Lord speaks like God. And you say, well, who is this person? But if, you, if I challenge you, go through those passages, take a look, get a concordance out, take a look, study those, and start to think about those and think critically. Who is that angel of the Lord? Anybody know? Those are the pre-incarnate appearances of Christ, visibly, physical, in the Old Testament, walking on the earth. Take a look at them and uh, do some research on that and you'll find out. They're called Christophanies. Okay? But you'll find them in all critical locations where, the, where Israel was in trouble, the angel of the Lord showed up to serve them. He's also known as the angel of the Lord's presence. So take a look at that. Again, think critically about what you read. Love the word. Remember your Christian walk is not a game. There are real consequences here. And frankly, this society is in desperate need of Christian uh, truth and principles. People are being crushed in the society. It's essentially a merciless society these days as it moves into the moral relativism. I'll try to stand still. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite verses is this one, not uh, seen very often, but the kingdom of God uh, consists not in words but in power. And another way to say that, faith without works is dead. Again, Dr. Mullen, President Mullen, in her speech today talked about you have to execute. It's not enough to simply have this, make the statements. You have to actually live those statements. So again, these are some of the lessons you should be learning here at Houghton, and they will carry through the rest of your life. Not surprisingly, I'm a big believer in the mission of the college. You need to be that scholar servant. Uh, uh, this will not only benefit yourself, but again, society. Society is in desperate need of these folks uh, to turn this uh, tide of essentially moral relativism. And what is moral to relativism? It's essentially a focus on self and basically in judges. You know, everything, there was no uh, king in Israel. Everyone did was right in their own eyes. And that is the essence of moral relativism. No truth. I can do whatever I want. It's all about me. And that's increasingly where it is, and I see it in government. Okay, lesson two. This may be a little bit more difficult. When confronted with a critical decision, whatever it may be, okay, you, generally the hard choice is the right choice. Now this is, tends to be contrary to what I see sometimes in Christian circles. You see a lot in Christian circles where they'll say, I have this decision to make. The door has been opened by the Lord. That's the, that's the door I need to go through. My suggestion to you is that that's generally not the right decision. Now, this is not a 100% guarantee. Usually the harder decision, the decision of the one that's going to cost you or test your faith is the one that's important for you to go to. So let's just even take a look at, and I've got the Matthew verse up here, the salvation decision. You know, you've got two, two gates. One is the broad gate, the easy gate, the path that you can bring all your baggage with you. The other is the salvation gate, which is a narrow gate, and you've got to give it all up. Which is the right gate? It's the hard choice, the one that makes you give it all up. And that's only the beginning of your walk with Christ. So usually that hard decision is the right decision. I'm going to give you an illustration, biblical illustration from the life of Abraham, and then an illustration from my own life. Let's take a look at Abraham, a critical uh, character in the Old Testament. First the decision he has to make, the Lord tells him to leave the Ur of Chaldees. Where am I going? Mm, not going to tell you. Uh, what's going to be there? Mm, we don't need to know that yet. Okay? Does he have a highway to get there? No. It's a long journey across dangerous lands. Did he pass that test? The easy decision would have been to stay, correct? The hard decision was to go. The answer, of course, he did pass that test. Another little fact is, by the way, you need to leave your family. Did he pass that test? Test your biblical knowledge of the Old Testament. Actually, he failed that test. Who did he take with him that he shouldn't have taken? 
Father, he left and and Lot is the character who took with him. He took Lot with him, his cousin. I believe it was his cousin, Matthew, I think it was. Matthew. He took Lot with him. 